everyone. Welcome to the inaugural episode of First in Fiction with Molly Jo Really, This is really a long time coming. You'll know that I was the producer of First in Fiction with Aaron Gansky and his dad, Alton Gansky. They turned it over to me a few years ago and I was so intimidated by that. I chose to not do anything and I sat around until finally I just realized that I need to own this. They gave this to me and I need to honor them. So I'm moving forward with First in Fiction I, with Molly Joe, really. I've rebranded it a little bit. You'll see that the tagline for Aaron used to have it. Now I've changed it. So it is a podcast for writers. Start, write, repeat. And we're going to help you out every couple of weeks. We're going to have episodes with amazing guest stars. Like I'm super excited about our very first guest here tonight. And I'll introduce him in just a minute. I hope you're going to stay subscribed to the channel. And if you have any questions, drop comments. If you have ideas for speakers, drop comments, share the videos, and just let us know how you're doing on your writer's journey. And now I would like to introduce you on our very first, first in fiction with Molly Joe, really, our very first guest. I've met him at Blue Ridge years ago. He is very knowledgeable about podcasts for writers. So tonight we are talking on a podcast for writers about podcasts for writers. Andrew Jackson. Hey, Molly, I am so excited to be on this inaugural uh, episode of the podcast. First in Fiction is a great, great show. I'm glad that it's re, you know, re-energized. And with you, that means a lot of energy. So <laughs> Thank I'm you. excited. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, so tell us yeah, a little bit about yeah. what you're going to talk about tonight. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I... Um, came across this podcast thing uh, back when it was getting started. I had some clients that wanted to explore it for their websites. It was still all very new. And so I dove in as a listener first to try to dissect what podcasts are all about. And when I started to dissect them, I figured out a couple of ways to build out a good quality podcast. And then over the years, I've had the opportunity to apply that to a couple of different shows in different industries. And um for different personalities. And now, you know, podcasting is just a huge segment of the media, um, of the media landscape, right? And so, so it's important to, to have one if, if you wanna use it for some marketing purposes. I was just gonna say, why is it that podcasts have seemed to taken over? People still send out newsletters and blog posts or even printed magazines every so often. Why are podcasts the new norm? Yeah, I think it comes down to content consumption methods, right? And that's just a fancy way of saying, how do you get what you like? Um, humans by nature enjoy good story, right? Yes. And so if you can present compelling information in a way that they enjoy consuming, whether that's through print for some folks, whether it's through television or video presentation, or whether that's through auditory methods, um, just simply through listening to the information, and whether that information is for education or for entertainment. Um, there, are, there are several ways people can acquire the information they're looking for. Podcasts flip into a unique method of getting information into our heads and into our hearts, because just like with listening to music, or talk radio, um, or even audiobooks to a certain degree, listening to podcasts is somewhat passive, okay? So you can do it while you're cleaning the house, or you're working on laundry, or you're cooking dinner, or you're driving to and from work, or you're commuting you know, on a bus or a train um, while you're flying. There are lots of places where we have this void of time I think it was Zig Ziglar that used to call it um, in the in the car when they used to sell cassette tapes to train mm -hmm. salespeople. They called it um, the uh, automobile university or car you. You know, you could sit in your car when you're coming and going to sales calls and learn all about sales methods and sales techniques. So podcasts fit right into that zone where you can passively listen, and then when you want to really hone in on what someone's saying you can focus a little bit more. But there's an interesting aspect to podcasts in that while they are passive listening, or you, know, you can then mentally engage them. So 
there are times where when you're driving, it's just background noise and it's entertaining you or it's just giving you a little bit of trickle information. Mm -hmm. But at other times, you really want to hone in on what they're saying. And podcasts are great because you can rewind and replay and get back into that information whenever you want. And so they have this unique deliverability of content that people find so useful. Um, also, the definition of podcast, you'd be surprised. It's very fluid at this point. Uh, sure. I went to Podcast Movement. It's a great convention or conference. And uh, I went to Podcast Movement in 2019. And someone on stage was de declaring that podcasts are anything the listener wants it to be. So if it's on-demand audio, they consider it a podcast. If it's on-demand video, they consider it a podcast. And they found this out through research and, and talking to consumers about where do you get podcasts and what do you classify as a podcast, which is why delivery methods have exploded. You can take this audio podcast and record it as a video and then deliver it as a video on YouTube uh, splice out the audio and deliver it as just audio and carve up little segments and, you know, run it as a whole. There's all these ways that you can deliver the same segment of content. Um, I want to thank you right now. I don't mean to interrupt, that? but I said, I want, I yes, just want to thank you right now for, for validating every thought and goal I have for the new first in fiction. <laughs> All of those things it's, you mentioned are all the different venues and ways I thought of getting this podcast out to the public. Video, audio, splice it, segment it, put little bits and pieces. We yeah. talked about that in the pre-show. So um, you have validated me without even trying. And, and now I feel like, yeah, we're doing the right thing. So thank you. Yeah, but <laughs> if you're just starting with a podcast, or even, even if you're old hat, right? If you've been running a podcast for a while and you've only been doing audio delivery, which is absolutely fine. Um, the one warning I would give is don't feel overwhelmed by all of those potential methods. If you think you mm -hmm. wanna start dabbling in video delivery, try it a little bit, get it out there, see what kind of response your audience gives you and then dive deeper or diversify into other methods. Okay. You don't have to take it all on at once. So let's talk a little bit about a video method for podcasts. First of all, we're here on Zoom and we're doing a pre-recording that we're going to upload to my server and share it later. So that allows me to edit content if needed, but it also allowed you to put up this great backdrop. So for those in listening audio only, tell us what's behind you and why that's such a personal photo. Yeah, this is a photo of Mount Mulanje that's in Malawi, Africa, a country in Southern Africa. And this photo was taken by me during uh, my first mission trip to Africa. And uh, so it's a very sentimental, uh, you know, picture for me, it brings back a lot of memories. And it's also a great, a great talking point. People love to ask, what is that? Mm -hmm. Where is that? Um, so anyway, that's the backdrop that I've chosen. That's the one that I typically use on interviews now. Nice. So you're not just a writer. You're a podcaster. You're a missionary. You're a husband and a dad. So you've got a whole bunch of different buckets and hats that you're carrying and wearing, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. How do you find time to do the writing that you do? Sure. That's a great question, right? That's the... $64 million question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, writing for me gets squeezed into free moments. And, and like you just listed off, you know, a whole bunch of obligations and a whole bunch of um, responsibilities. But I found early on that if I did, and you know, a lot of people are going to groan at this, wake up a little earlier, I was able to get about two hours squeezed into each and every day. So if I was able to get up about two hours earlier than the rest of my family, that provided me enough time for a quiet cup of tea, a little bit of reflective writing, a little bit of study, a little bit of personal reading, and a little bit of um, free, free writing, right? So not maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not something where I'm really honed in on the storyline or trying to flesh out a theme, but just free writing, stuff that comes to you from you know, prompts or um, stuff that might evolve later into a full story. Uh, but some of that free writing, like I said, it, it did evolve into full stories and they've been published. And so that's, that's great. So for me, 
the best time that I have found to write is early in the morning. Um, and I used to be a night owl. And so I, I would do some writing when I was a night owl, but over time that's shifted. And I find that the morning is a great time to start, so. Nice. Yeah, I found when, um, when my daughter was very young, I didn't have time for writing. I gave it up for a small season. And as she became a teenager and older and started going out with friends, I would kick her out of the house. I'd say, you know, go to the movies for two hours or do this or do that. I need to do some writing. And that worked out well. But like you, it was grab as you go. I've heard, I've heard the theory and I call it a theory. It's not a fact. It's not, it's not a rule. Make an office space, make a dedicated space, make a dedicated time and your muse will show up. And that is true. That can work. But sometimes we don't always have time or space to do all of that. You'll see that I basically have a cat roaming all over the desk here. Well, I can't kick her <laughs> out because I'm in my living room. This is her space. So I'm just thankful that she's not howling at the screen right now. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's a lot that goes with being a writer. I liked what you said about in the podcast, how you can listen to it passively and it'll still sink in. I tend to not think that way. I need to focus on what I'm hearing because I'm very animated and I will take a sketchbook and kind of doodle my way through what I'm hearing. That helps me to hear it more, to perceive it more. But I mm -hmm. do like mm -hmm. it. The video ones I can put up on my TV, you know, pull up on my monitor. And I, if it's video, I can listen to it while I'm cleaning house, like you said, and walk away from it and then go back and say, did I miss anything? But for some right. reason, if it's audio only, I cannot, I cannot do anything else. I think maybe because if it's audio for me, my brain is trying to come up with those images. Whereas if it is a video, I could say, okay, I know who that is, or I know what they're showing and I can walk away and still be secure in what the knowledge is there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the thing. If, if your audience, when you're, you know, building out a podcast, um, if they respond well to some of the video episodes that you post, you, you might think about decorating those up with uh, slides, simple, you know, a slide stack um, so that your information is, is kind of splashed on the screen while you're talking about it. Resources are on the screen, that type of thing. Examples of what you're talking about are splashed on the screen. Although a lot of the video, quote unquote, video podcasts that I've seen, they simply use the album cover or a still image, um, maybe a still image of the guest, maybe an image of the host. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, the album cover has been one of the most popular methods of displaying that. And then they just let it run. Uh, they have the audio there and it's just enhanced by the album cover. Mm -hmm. um, to me, I think that's shortchanging your video audience. I think really you should put up a slide stack or you should give examples or um, take the time to capture the best quality video that you have available to you and use that as a true video presentation. Um, for me, it's kind of like an iceberg. You capture at the highest level, at the highest quality, grab video whenever you can. Um, and then once you have that video file, you can isolate the audio. You can isolate stills from the video. Um, you can make clips if you want, but, but let's say you just did the whole audio capture, um, then you could transcribe it or have it transcribed for you. Uh, now you've got a full text stack and you can work with that. Um, there is a great resource that I would recommend to not only podcasters, but also to writers who are trying to promote their work. Um, Amy Woods wrote a book called Content 10X. And Content 10X is a wonderful resource for figuring out ways to capture the information you're trying to convey and carve it up so that it can be useful on multiple platforms. Uh, from web to video to social media to email delivery and even um, you know delivery through print or uh, presentations on stage. So she does a great job of analyzing what businesses and organizations and individuals are doing, what they're experts at, and then finding ways to capture it and carve it up for delivery because then that those those different elements become wonderful marketing pieces. That sounds very interesting. And I'm definitely going to have to look into that book now. So along those lines, what was the first craft book that you read or say the first two or three that not just the ones you read, but the ones that really made an impression on you where you were looking at these pages mm -hmm. and say, I get it. 
this authenticates me as a writer because I'm doing this or I want to do this or I understand it. Yeah, I, I'll tell you one that came across really, really strong for me was a uh, bird, um, bird by bird. I yes, it's called uh, by Anne Lamont. Wonderful book. Um, but of course, it was recommended, I think, by uh, Stephen James. And I love his his two books that he has out. Uh, Story Trump's Structure is a wonderful mm -hmm. piece. Um, but then even older than that, I found a book um, called uh, Stealing Fire from the Gods. And this was an analysis of uh, story structure built loosely on the hero's journey by, um, oh, all the words are escaping me. Um, Joseph Campbell wrote Hero of a Thousand Faces. Yes. Right? So that's a wonderful analysis of mythology structure and story structure uh, from world religions over time. Stealing Fire from the Gods uh, was a breakdown of that and an analysis for storytelling and screenwriting. And so it took the hero's journey and it moved it into a more applicable uh, framework for me. And when I read that book, it just, I mean, lights were flaring and, you know, bells were going off and I just got it. And so for story structure, that was a wonderful one. Um, Eat Shoots and Leaves, that's a great grammar book, a lot of funny mm. and, and uh, full of information. So I don't know, I've, I've got a huge stack of books. So, <laughs> you know, if you're not learning, then you're falling behind. So, yeah, I agree with that. All right. So you're in a place and you have writer's block and mm. your brain can't function anymore. You cannot write. Okay. You need something but not writing related where do you find your respite what is your go-to break hmm. in in order to kick start my writing again or or just to unplug and, well, and get out of sometimes it's the same thing right i find yeah. that when i am stuck if i unplug i do regenerate. Mm -hmm. last night i went out to a free movie in the park with one of my friends and i saw one of my most favorite movies that thing you do I love oh, that movie. movie. I love that movie. And and when I found that it was showing for free outside in the park, I'm like, okay, we're going. I mean, that, and I quoted yeah. the movie all the way through it. Thank goodness there were 200 other people who didn't hear me because I just love that movie. But as soon as I got home, just because of what that movie means to me, the music, the inspiration, I mean, that Tom right. Hanks wrote, directed, and starred in it all by himself. That was his vehicle that he did to show off different talents that he had, you know, take a, a turn in his career as well as the storyline of the one hit wonders and anybody can do anything if you apply yourself. So that movie always rejuvenates me. And I just came home and I just was able to put some words on, on into the laptop. And that was really exciting for me. So unplugging can be the same yeah. thing as recharging. What's that for you? So what for does me, that look I'd like? I'd say whether, whether it's with writing or whether it's with, um, you know, work-related stress or uh, life-related stress, I typically turn to music as a decompression mm -hmm. and as a reflection tool. And so um, music is filled with emotion for me and imagery. And so even if I uh, turn on the radio or I turn on uh, my Pandora playlist, right, and just hit shuffle, um, I find that before long, Familiar songs will evoke emotion and imagery that I can't escape. And before long, I'm pulling over in a parking lot or I'm running into the house to grab my journal and I'm jotting down more story ideas. So, you know, I go from like complete writer's block or, or, or you know, like an overstressed active mind that just needs to decompress and relax. And so I turn on familiar music and that familiar music both you know calms me down and then it moves me into a place where I'm inspired to be creative again so I'd say music for me that I would say it's definitely a, a second for me movies and tv I just kind of attach to that but sometimes it's not always good if I want to decompress or unplug 
because if it's a bad movie yes i'm right. watching it and i don't mean bad like trashy i mean bad yes. like how did they let this go to public right <laughs> and i will see I'll, I'll end up in my head needing to rewind it at home obviously i'll need to rewind it like two or three times because i'm so busy in my head rewriting the scene that yeah, yeah, like, yeah, that wouldn't exactly. happen oh i would have said it this way or that way and and i don't go to movie theaters anymore for a lot of reasons for the distractions of people around me but also because i cannot pay attention all the way through at the movie theater i want to be on my phone i want to be making notes i want to rewind yes. it and pause it and say okay let me pay attention to this so yeah, I and TV completely agree. It's some movies uh, and television series are good demonstrations of story structure and some um, and, and character development and theme and all the elements of good story. Mm -hmm. But some are just just horrible or they had a lot of potential and somewhere in there um, they lost the thread. And and for me, like you said, it's a huge distraction because then you're just saying, well, that's not correct. They should have taken the story in this direction and it would have arced better or would have had a better outcome, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I guess they got, you know, they got the film up there on the screen. Right? We didn't, so I, yeah. <laughs> yet, yet, yeah. Yet. But, when, but when we have our movies up there, it's going to be made from the books that were written by there us. And they're going to be so well-written that people will not be in the audience saying, man, I could have done better, right? There you go. That's it. Go. That's our goal. Okay, I give us a five-year goal to get that done. <laughs> All right. So, Andrew, we're almost out of time. Not completely, but I have a few questions. I want to pull this up and see. So, how long have you been in the writing industry? Yeah, I'd say that probably goes back um, officially to like 2015, 2016, when I really started to explore my writing. Um, and I really, that, that happened as a result of me just playing around with friends. Uh, you know, I would, I would write short pieces for them, or we would, um, you know, share short stories with one another. And I had this idea for a, for an interesting, maybe, maybe it could have been a serial, or maybe it could have just been a couple of um, uh, short chapters, but I mentioned it to a friend and I said, you know, I, I don't think that, I don't think that this could get published in the Christian market i you know should i should i go forward with this and they really encouraged me by saying that um you can you can publish a wide array of story in the quote unquote christian market um as long as it adheres to some core principles and values of christianity or it's conveying uh you know without being preachy some um core tenets of of faith uh and really what is good story more than moving a hero or a heroine through tragedy or challenge and demonstrating how they choose to rise to the challenge? And if they can rise to the challenge, utilizing biblical principles or, uh, or their faith, or their faith is strengthened through that challenge, well, then, you know, then the outcome is a good demonstration of Christian biblical principles and worldview. So to that end, um, I started exploring the writing that I love. And, and I'll tell you, um, for some people, the stuff that I write, uh, it's, it's not for everybody. I, I practice in the area of uh, uncanny speculative fiction. And so for anybody that's not familiar, that, that's the weird, crazy kids at the back of the room, you know, that you're <laughs> like, where in the world... These are the folks that fall in the Ray Bradbury, Shirley Jackson, Roald Dahl, Stephen King, um, Richard Matheson, um, even H.P. Lovecraft. Um, these are some of my favorite authors, right? right. Um, not all of them necessarily exhibit Christian worldviews, but I love their uncanny fiction. I love the nature of their stories to make you feel unsettled and, and ill at ease. Um, and so what I would like to do is point out through my fiction that there are malevolent forces just below the surface tugging us all down, but that there's another force more, be more benevolent than we deserve, which works to keep us buoyant. And it's that, that struggle for each of my heroes and heroines, you know, whether it's a large scale or very, very small scale, um, each of their stories demonstrates that there are all of these forces trying to do them in 
conquer them or challenge them or bring them down. Um, but there is one benevolent force that steps in and helps out. And that's seen through the actions of some of the other characters or through circumstances that they move through. So. I love that. And, and not only is that, obviously we're, we're talking fictional stories, but that is reality. I mean, that that's the reality that we as Christians, that is the world that we live in. We are being weighted down. It's a given it's going to happen, but God is there lifting us up. And someone told me many, many years ago that all stories and all love songs are really praises to God, even the secular ones that didn't mean to be. You know, Flannery O'Connor was almost excommunicated from the Catholic Church because of what she wrote, what seemed to be so dark and dismal. But I love yeah. her theory, yeah. and I'm paraphrasing it, but what she would say is, how can we show the glory of God unless we show what the glory of God overcomes? Yes, exactly. That's wonderful. Yeah. You know? And that's that's yeah. my theory. If we if we don't if we don't acknowledge that there is grit and dirt and darkness in our lives, if we leave that out of our writing, all we're going to have is fluff and nursery rhymes, mm -hmm. which are nursery rhymes are good when you're a child, but when you're an adult and you want real food, you need some sustenance to go with it. I'm not saying get into all the gory details. We don't need all that stuff. But oh, we no. do need I mean, to acknowledge it. It's there. And to say that it right. doesn't exist is giving the devil a foothold and a platform to say, oh, if you don't believe that that exists, then, you know, he's going to be able to push further and further across these boundaries that we haven't set. You know, you make a really good point that I, I try to strike upon whenever I have a conversation with folks about um, uncanny fiction or the genres of horror or um, the genres of science fiction or fantasy. And it's the fact that um, much of our modern storytelling has a lot, books, movies, television, has a lot of gratuitous violence, uh, coarse language, and sexuality on display, full mm -hmm. force, mm -hmm. without, without reserve. Yes. And I really strive to keep that out of my work. Um, you, you know, you might, you might call it clean fiction, right? However, I believe that you can still touch on those topics and you can still exhibit um, the challenges of those really, really dark occurrences in our life um, or, or in the lives of your characters, I should say. And you can do that using the whole vocabulary that's open to us in the dictionary yes. and really move people's emotions, really evoke uh, you know, their responses. You can get a tingling spine going through the word choices that you select rather than the harsh imagery that you, you know, you bluntly hit someone in the face with. I would much rather take a cue from the classics that are able to work up your emotions and work up your response to what's happening to the characters in the scene than to just bluntly, you know, throw it on the page um, in all of its gory, detail mm -hmm. uh you know expletive laden detail so no i i i much rather prefer to use the words available to me to um to really work up emotion and work up response you know what i absolutely love that and while you were talking i have decided that that's going to be the theme of episode two excellent is how to use your words without using your words right there you go <laughs> All right, Andrew, we are out of time. So where can people find you online? Sure. Please visit me at aejackson.com. I've got some free, short, uncanny speculative fiction for your enjoyment. And uh, you can learn about me, read a few of the blog posts I have rolling. Um, and of course, you know, I have uh, links to all of my social profiles as well. I look forward to meeting you as a new reader. Great. Thanks so much. And you can find me at mollyjoreally.com. That last name is R-E-A-L-Y. I am not an adverb. So it is one L. <laughs> Adverbs do not like to be used. mollyjoreally.com and at mollyjoreally everywhere else on social media. Guys, have a beautiful night. Thanks for joining us. Keep writing. <laughs>